Okay. Um, welcome everybody to the um, fourth and final for the summer of 2020 um, lunch and learn with the Valley Forge Park Alliance. Uh, the Tredifferent Public Libraries are very happy and proud to be partnering with the Valley Forge Alliance um, for another summer. Uh, we are also uh, sort of partnering with the uh, Tredifferent East Town Historical Society and the King of Prussia Historical Society to bring in a broader audience to share this wonderful information about Valley Forge Park and to share our local history. Um, I'd like to pass this on to Molly Duffy, who's with the Valley Forge Park Alliance, to tell you a little bit about that organization. Molly? Thanks. Thanks, Marianne. I first want to thank you and the Tredifferent Library for making this possible, because I think this is probably our most well-attended lunch and learn ever. So there's, it's not all bad doing things virtually, as it turns out. And I also want to thank Justin, who's presenting for us today, who has drawn this huge crowd over this very interesting topic. So for those of you who might not know the Valley Forge Park Alliance, we're the nonprofit partner for Valley Forge National Historical Park. And while, you, while I have a captive audience, I'll let you know of our upcoming events, since this is our last lunch and learn for the summer. On October 6th, we will be starting a virtual speaker series and it will run through June. And it is also being led by Justin. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll be putting out information soon about the speaker series and it really looks great. So I think if you like this, you'll definitely like the speaker series. We will also be doing a virtual film premiere of the brand new Valley Forge Visitor Center film, which is soon to be, well, it's almost finished and the premiere will be on Zoom through the Alliance. So we hope you can join us on October 29th for that. We will also be doing an Instagram silent auction this fall with lots of really interesting, unique historical items. So we hope you'd like to check that out. And just generally, I really do wanna thank you all for your support. We couldn't do a program like this or anything we do without all of our members. So thank you so much. You really make this possible, truly. And if you're not a member and you love the park, I suggest you join the Alliance. So it's really the best way that you can help Valley Forge Park, the park that we all love so much. So thanks for joining us. And I'm gonna turn this over to Justin. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. All right, so uh, I'd like to share the screen uh, if I could. Sure, Zoe, can you, thank you. All right, all right, all right. well, thank you for this opportunity to, to speak, uh, both the Park Alliance and for different libraries. Uh, this is a, a talk that I've wanted to do for a little while, and it, this is a very good venue for it. Uh, it's not exactly uh, conducive. Uh, to have a lot of visuals during tours. So this can be a bit fun. But I wanna talk about what this talk is and what it is not. Uh, so this is not part of a, a body of original research that I'm compiling. Uh, and it is also not uh, some collection of secret archeological evidence that uh, is, is classified or, or kept away from the public. Uh, through Valley Forge National Historical Park. They have to keep some things from the public just because they have to prevent looters potentially from destroying archeological sites. Uh, so everything that this talk is based on are either primary source written documents or archeological evidence that is in the public domain that is already published. So very important things uh, to quickly make note of. All right. And now the process of building structures for troops, housing troops, is not something new to the American Revolution. I've included this image from Crown Point. This is during the Seven Years' War. This is in upstate New York, just because it features a variety of interesting structures. You see huts, the rows of tents, uh, these weird uh, projections here. These are actually stumps. Uh, but you see that there are some structures that look more like lean-tos. Uh, other structures, uh, these are um, either lean, 
either brush huts uh, or perhaps they're covering over uh, a tent, uh, you know, with brush. Uh, it's for insulation purposes. It's difficult to say, but there's a variety of different structures here, brush huts and so on. And on the end here, we have something that looks a little bit more like a Native American longhouse. This is probably uh, what you call a wigwam. Uh, most likely has a bark roof. Uh, so it's interesting to see this variety of different uh, housing opportunities uh, for the troops rather than just having them in tents. Now we have to be careful with the use of the word hut uh, because it comes up in letters and orderly books and journals all the time. Uh, but when you see the word hut, it doesn't necessarily mean hut like we're accustomed to at Valley Forge. So if you look at Wilmington, the encampment at Wilmington, just prior to Valley Forge, uh, they talk about building huts and sleeping inside huts. But what they're describing are, it, these are brush huts, right? Uh, so this is from the Xavier Delegata painting, The Battle of Paoli. Uh, and this is Wayne's division. They had camped in brush huts. Simple structures constructed of brush. You can build one in a matter of a few hours. You're just using hatchets and cutting down, uh, you know, whatever brush uh, is, is found locally in the woods. Uh, so these can be made really quickly, and that's different from the huts that we see more at Valley Forge. Now, there's a bit of disagreement whether or not it was a good idea to encamp the army in huts. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this, uh, but uh, there was a debate going on whether it was healthy, you know, whether it was conducive to the health of the soldiers to live inside these huts. So from these two quotations, you can see that there is an argument among the senior staff of the Continental Army under General George Washington. Now they're looking at two alternatives towards the end, either camping uh, and entirely in a city of huts or to perhaps go to Wilmington in Delaware, right? Wilmington, there are a lot of buildings there you can potentially find the winter quarters there. And it is traditional for European armies to divide up their forces during the winter and to be separate winter garrisons and to the towns and villages and hamlets and small cities because you can find existing buildings and structures in these places. And you can uh, either occupy abandoned buildings perhaps by loyalists who have fled uh, or rent out buildings that are owned uh, by people living in these areas. Uh, and you can make up the shortage, of course, by building huts, uh, you know, just on a, a very uh, uh, small basis. And this is what the Army has done the last two years. But they want to remain close to Philadelphia in order to keep an eye on the British there. You know, this is the capital of the United States. It's the capital of the state of Pennsylvania, right? In the Pennsylvania State Assembly, they desperately want it back. So Washington is charged with staying in a very tight radius to that city. So that's not really a good idea to divide up your troops into smaller garrisons, right? If you're a single night march away from Philadelphia, right, 20 miles away or so, well, the British could potentially surprise a small garrison and take it, right? This is what happened at the Battle of Trenton, where the Continental Army crossed the Delaware River and captured the Hessian garrison person there because General Sir William Howe had divided up his British and Hessian forces throughout New Jersey. So staying that close to Philadelphia, they didn't have the luxury of dividing up into smaller winter quarters. So this is where you take 12,000 people, an entire city's worth of people who arrive overnight in one location in the middle of plowed farm fields and they have to build winter housing for an entire city. This is the fifth largest city in the United States at this point when they arrive. So that gives you an idea of the scale of this thing. Now, Valley Forge, of course, uh, one of the opportunities for it, uh, it made an ideal location because of the topography, this natural ridge line, of course, for the defense, uh, the Schuylkill River as well. Uh, but there is a lot of available lumber in these hills, like on Mount Joy. Uh, you know, they, these hills are not very conducive to agriculture, so that's why there are a lot of trees that are available for them to cut down. So part of the choice in picking Valley Forge was the availability of lumber. Now, the huts are also organized according to the proper discipline of a camp. Uh, it's the science of organizing military encampments is called castrumentation, right? So the castrumentation of the military encampment 
this is a good example of that. And uh, you have the quarter guard and the bells of arms holding uh, the muskets in the front of the encamp. You have the rows of uh, tents with the sergeant's tents on the ends, the field officers behind that, then the uh, brigade or division officers uh, beyond that. And then you have uh, the camp kitchens where they're cooking their food. Sometimes you have settleries and the uh, privies, the vault uh, that, uh, you know, where soldiers do their business. Uh, that is going to be outside the camp somewhat, either far to the rear of the camp or maybe uh, ahead of the quarter guard by um, uh, a quarter mile or so, as you want to keep the soldiers healthy and away from that. Now, this is an example where you see that castrumentation of the camp with the Continental Army. It had three rows of tents. Again, behind that, the field officers, and behind that, uh, you know, maybe a colonel or, or a brigade commander beyond that. So they're organizing their tents in this military fashion, and they do the same thing with brush huts and also with huts for winter quarters as well. Now, we see this a little bit with some of the archaeology that has gone on. Here at Maxwell's Brigade, so you can see that there, um, you have two rows of huts. Uh, they're neatly spaced out. The dimensions of the huts uh, somewhat closely follow the dimensions and general orders. Uh, diary entries describe them as 16 by 18 feet. Uh, the archaeology bears this out somewhat. Interestingly, you can see that one of them has a chimney in the corner. Uh, so that is something that we're going to follow up on. Uh, these are from 1962 excavations. Unfortunately, a lot of these early excavations, they didn't record the depth of the floors, which is uh, a very uh, useful data point that tells us a lot. Um, yeah. Now, one of the other aspects we see with the huts is the dovetail joint versus the saddle notch. The saddle notch is what we've used predominantly at Valley Forge with the reconstructions. Uh, now, in the early 20th century and even the late 19th century, there are these accounts of people coming across some of the uh, wooden rails from these huts that were surviving. And they sometimes recovered these rails. Uh, and one of them uh, survived in someone's uh, attic until the 19, uh, 1930s. So you do have this institutional memory within the, the Valley Forge State Park. Uh, where there was this difference in uh, the two different types of notches. And again, the, the dovetail notch, because it comes to a point, as long as you preserve this angle, it doesn't matter what size uh, log you have, it'll always fit. Whereas the saddle notch, you have to be a little bit more careful. Uh, the saddle notch, that the curvature of that notch has to be individually carved to fit uh, the particular size of the rail underneath it. So there is an advantage to doing it one way versus the other. If you have an, a saw, you're definitely going to be doing the dovetail notch instead of the saddle notch. But it's just to let the public know that there is uh, a bit of variation in terms of uh, the hut construction. Uh, and that is really the purpose of this talk, just bringing to the public information that you may not be aware of uh, that uh, is known throughout the park with uh, staff and volunteers, but is not widely known uh, with the public at large. So here we have an idealized reconstruction of the hut. So this would probably be very familiar for most people. Uh, and the hut, uh, it corresponds loosely to the general orders laying out the dimensions for the, the hut. And again, this is an idealized reconstruction. Now, the first thing that uh, we have to keep in mind is that they're cutting down every tree in sight. You know, 12,000 people will trample down any kind of vegetation uh, that is there. They're also digging up the soil to use uh, the, the clay and mud for the chinking between the logs. Uh, these are already on plowed farm fields in many cases. So you're not going to see a lot of grass, <laughs> right? So what we're going to do throughout this talk is to show some of the various differences and changes uh, that you might see with the huts. Uh, I'd also like to say that uh, I welcome questions throughout. I, I very much like to have a, a conversation uh, rather than just sit here and lecture at you. So if at any point you have any questions, please go to the chat dialogue, enter your questions in there. 
and those will be communicated to me and uh, I can address them as we go. So please feel free to ask questions. Now, with the hut, uh, we have some examples of the chimney. This is called cat and clay chimneys. Uh, here are two historical examples. They're built on a stone foundation. In Wayne's Woods, many of the huts recovered there from archaeology, they do have more of a stone foundation uh, than you do in the Muhlenberg Brigades or the Virginia Brigades, or even Maxwell's or Conway's Brigades, because it's just the availability of stone. Uh, now, the orders were given to have 18 inches of clay or mud lining the chimneys to prevent these from catching fire. Uh, but you'll notice with these that the higher up you go, the smaller the logs get. Uh, I particularly like this 19th century print with a barrel uh, kind of uh, topping off this as one chimney. But the reason for this is simple. They don't have ladders. <laughs> it's not like they're building ladders at the same time they're building huts. So the lighter logs are going to go up top. So that, that shouldn't be any surprise. It's just human nature. Now, uh, so if we take our hut and we replace the, the chimney, well, that cat and clay chimney might be replaced with one with smaller huts the further up it goes. The same thing goes with uh, the, the hut itself, right? You're going to see smaller logs the higher up you go because it's harder to lift things, especially without uh, you know, modern ropes uh, and uh, you know, the availability of ropes and, and ladders that we have today. Uh, now, going a little bit further, when we look at the roof, Right, this is a shingled roof, and the shingles here, it's lightweight, which is good, but there is a shortage of nails, right? Iron nails are hard to come by, uh, and so as a result, they're coming up with some unique ways of fixing down the shingles of that roof. Uh, Joseph Plum Martin, a private uh, uh, in the, the Continental Army, he describes this, and he says they're bound on by a straight pole and widths. So widths are simply, you know, green sticks that are split or, or you know, cut away into to strips uh, or even small vines, anything that you can find like this that is green and flexible that they can use to tie, right? So they're using this to lash down any of those shingles or staves, as he calls them, because they're a bit longer, maybe uh, some of them at four feet in length, I think he says. So if we take this, what does this look like if we're fixing those with uh, those straight poles? So here's an example, right? So you have these poles and it's applying vertical pressure and it is also applying pressure uh, from keeping those tiles uh, the, uh, from slipping, right? So you see the post at this base, uh, which is resting on that log. Uh, those shingles are resting against it and so on, each one they have this pole that they're resting on from slipping further, and you have that vertical pressure as well, and they're all lashed down with those widths. So this is one of the most common roofing methods that the Continental Army likely applied, right? If they're going to be building anything with shingles, then those shingles are going to be held down in this fashion. Now, a lot of this is the scarcity of tools. Right, when the British Army swept in just a week after the Battle of Brandywine and uh, that small supply depot kept at Valley Forge, they destroyed a lot of food, a couple thousand barrels of flour and so on, but they also destroyed hundreds of, of barrels of other supplies, including barrels of iron nails that they could have used. Uh, so those are gone. A lot of tools were destroyed or captured by the British. Uh, and so that is one of the difficulties they have. If you have a hut that is entirely built using an ax, well, you have a problem because of these shingles, right? You first need to cut a length of lumber into segments of, of four feet or smaller before you can begin splitting them into either uh, slabs or, uh, or small um, uh, slates or, or uh, shingles. So without a saw, cutting those into lengths first, well, it's very difficult to make this style of roof. So if you only have axes and not access to saws, you might come up with a different roofing solution. One of them potentially is a thatched roof, <laughs> right? So this, this is a, an option. Uh, 
you know, they're using whatever material is on hand, you know, hay or straw, you know, you're going to want to use that for, for bedding or feed uh, for um, cattle or horses, uh, you know, using, uh, you know, the army transports. Uh, uh, but uh, if there's any kind of green scrub, any kind of thing that you can lash together and use, uh, this is potentially an option, something like or resembling a thatched roof. That's now, we, one question that came yes. in. Um, it's, I thought Joseph Plum Martin spent most of Valley Forge encampment in Downingtown. Did they have the same type of huts there or were they in houses? Uh, I actually uh, um, don't uh, know about that. Uh, uh, this, um, that account from Joseph Plum Martin, uh, I'm not entirely sure that it was uh, taken during the encampment of Valley Forge, but uh, it is a very uh, it's the most detailed example in terms of the quotation that's describing how these shingles are held on. So that's that's why I use that quote. Uh, so I, I guess that's an oversight on my part, uh, not having a date and location affixed to the, the quote, for which I apologize. Okay. And another question about how long would it take to build a hut? Uh, so it varies uh, because uh, some seem to, to have built a, a hut within a week. Uh, but uh, it takes a long time for the entire army to get settled into huts. So uh, you may have people sleeping in these before they've fixed a roof on. Uh, you may have them helping each other out. Uh, and once uh, one hut is finished, those tools become available and so on. Uh, so getting the, the whole army hutted uh, is something that's going to take uh, a few weeks. So it does go into January even though they first marched in on December 19th, 1777. And how much of the forest was cut down in making the huts? Yeah, there are a lot of different uh, quotes on that. Um, they are cutting wood as far out as a three mile radius. Uh, and I have uh, at times uh, taken that, that idea to the extreme that you know, within a mile, a mile and a half, uh, that they had cut down every single tree in sight uh, within a mile, within that small radius. Uh, but we do have some some accounts uh, of walking in the woods uh, close to Valley Forge. Uh, so uh, one French officer encountered uh, Colonel Lewis Cook. Um, he's uh, a St. Regis Mohawk uh, who attended uh, the encampment with the Oneida and. Uh, yeah, he encountered him while walking uh, in the woods. So there had to be some uh, some timber in the area that was not completely cut down. Now, going back to the roofing solutions, uh, we also have this description of slabs or uh, and the word staves could mean you know longer shingles uh, described similar to Joseph Le Martin. Uh, but uh, they may also be these long split slabs where you just split, you know, a piece of lumber lengthwise and this becomes what you use for your roof. Uh, so this uh, is what's described in general orders, the split slabs. And this is perhaps what that would look like, where you have these logs split, laid horizontally, they're overlapping each other. You can pack some uh, mud or clay into the joints. Uh, here I interpreted uh, pegs holding them down, uh, mostly because it's hard to Photoshop the widths. But uh, this, uh, they could easily use the widths as well. Uh, that would prevent them from having to drill holes for pegs. Uh, I replaced the door as well because uh, boards are hard to come by. You know, there are uh, mills within the area. They're, they're trying to get uh, lumber, uh, you know, either um, uh, cut boards or, uh, that uh, may be available. Penny Packer Mills, uh, a few miles away, there are carts and wagons bringing some of those um, boards over to the encampment, uh, and they can use those for uh, doors. But again, it's few and far between. Most of the doors are held together uh, in this fashion. Uh, if they didn't peg them, uh, potentially they could use a few nails. There's one account that says there are only five to six nails uh, per hut, and those are in the door. <laughs> um, there are also nails recovered archaeologically at a lot of these sites. So there are nails available, but again, uh, it's not what they're primarily relying upon. Uh, 
uh, for construction of these shelters. Uh, you have some people that said that there's not a nail in the single hut. Uh, we have an account that uh, describes that. But uh, you know, these, of course, there's going to be a lot of gaps in these slab style roofs. Uh, so they could pack uh, clay into them, but if clay is hard to come by, one other option is using sod, right? So sod <laughs> might look like this. And there are several accounts describing sod being put over these slab roofs. Uh, and in subsequent years, like the very next winter of 1778 to 79, you have orders going out saying, we don't want to repeat the mistakes of Valley Forge. You know, the illnesses that arise uh, from dampness when you have a sod uh, as part of your roof. So we know that they were doing things like this. Uh, because they just didn't want uh, that uh, that sod to be used in future years. Uh, so they, there is a lot of illness, and that illness, one big part of that is the dampness. Now, uh, there are various solutions uh, when it came to building these. Uh, one thing you see as well is that they're digging down. If you can dig down three feet, that's three feet less, you have to build upward. You save on labor, you save on lumber. Uh, and there's this added benefit that if you can dig below the frost line, there's a stabilization of temperature and it's actually going to be a bit warmer than it might otherwise be. Uh, the only difficulty with that is, uh, again, the dampness, right? So in subsequent years, you have orders not to do something like this. <laughs> Right, here's a, a depiction of what it might be like to have a hut that uh, with a sunken floor, you know, where, you know, they basically cut a basement or a cellar and, you know, they're building a roof above this. So in this interpretation, I have some fascine bundles, these bundles of sticks holding back the earth. Uh, and there are a lot of suggestions in the primary accounts that something like this happened. Uh, now, uh, Thomas Paine, when he visited the army, you know, the political pamphleteer, he described the army. He said it reminded him of a family of beavers. <laughs> so to me, that conjures up uh, the image of a, a beaver dam. Uh, and so I kind of like this image of, you know, a, a hut very close to the ground, uh, very narrow. I guess it, it does give you that idea. And uh, it's kind of fun to look at uh, the different options. Now, we do have accounts that describe that they were first building up the wall six feet or so. We have plenty of accounts that describe a gabled roof, uh, but we don't know if that's the only option. They could, there could be a lean-to style roof, you know, which is just a single roof slanted in one direction. If you remember the, the images from Crown Point I had at the very beginning. Uh, so we have to imagine that all these huts, they, they could, there could be a wide variety of roofing solutions, a wide variety of the, the joints, whether it's a dovetail or a saddle notch, uh, a wide variety of how, uh, which uh, way they're oriented and so on. You know, you can save on labor if you put that door on the corner. You know, you don't have to saw these pieces of timber into two, right? You could potentially just form a crude door in the corner or even throw the chimney in a corner and you can save on labor instead of having to kind of cut more logs to create an opening. So there is archaeological evidence for chimneys that uh, are cut into corners, for doors that are, are positioned in corners as well. Uh, so I'm trying to get you to imagine the wide variety of different uh, huts that you might have seen throughout Valley Forge. And it would differ from brigade to brigade. If you remember that uh, image from uh, Maxwell's brigade, you know, they, it was pretty regimented. Those those huts were in nice even rows. They're all is a uniform size, uh, but that's not the case uh, all throughout uh, the encampment. So uh, I like yes. A couple please. of questions did come in. Um, how many huts were built, and um, what types of illnesses were at Valley Forge? Which it looks like you're going yes, to talk about you. next. Yeah. Um, well, the we only have estimates for the number of huts. Uh, I've heard uh, the number 400 thrown around. Uh, and there are also officers' huts. Uh, so, you know, you have 12 men per hut for the private soldiers. 
you have uh, maybe six officers for the, uh, the, the field officers uh, uh, in the, the officer huts uh, and so on. Maybe if you're a, a rank above that major or colonel, you would uh, have a, a hut uh, more towards yourself. So there are a lot of possibilities uh, in terms of that number. I, I've heard a lot of numbers thrown around. Uh, 400 is what I've heard most commonly. Now in terms of disease, you have typhoid, dysentery, uh, typhus, uh, you know, these communicable camp diseases. Uh, and part of the problem is that uh, you have, uh, you know, these unsanitary conditions. The damp isn't uh, helping any, uh, but they're also tracking a lot of mud into, you know, these huts. Uh, if they're low to the ground, uh, you know, like this 19th century historical example, they're prone to flooding. Uh, so, oh, okay. Uh, so they're prone to, to flooding and, uh, you know, that, that flooding does bring with it uh, a lot of, of mud. Uh, actually, I've had uh, a, a correction uh, with uh, the huts. Uh, <laughs> the number of huts, at, um, that number of being uh, 1,700 uh, and above, uh, upwards of uh, 2,000. So uh, that's considerably more than, uh, than 400 huts. So yeah, 1,700 being the low number, um, 2,100 uh, being the high number of huts. And remember, there are a wide variety of these. They might be using them for storage. Uh, and we don't really know about the women uh, that are with the encampment. You know, the 800 uh, or, or so uh, or, or more women that are with the encampment, are, are they with the soldiers sharing the same space? So the, that, uh, that number of 12, are, are there women on top of that number sharing the same space? Uh, were they able? Were some of them able to have uh, their own structures built? So a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of possibilities that we just don't know about. And now, another another yes. hut structure question: uh, mm -hmm. Was the ground rocky enough to provide the stone for so many foundations and fireplaces? Yeah, you do see enough stone with Wayne's uh, and Wayne's Woods, the brigades that are stationed there. You do not see that so much with the Virginia regiments uh, and this uh, is depicting archaeology from there these excavations during the 1970s uh, and here the the, the stone is uh, you might have a single layer you know in the hearth but uh, you don't have a, a lot of stone uh, you're not going to see it around the foundation of the hut uh, in fact sometimes the only evidence you have of that wall is the discoloration in the soil from that log that is rotted away. Was there a second question? Um, that's it for now. Okay. Now, uh, I'd like to draw attention to, to this. If you have this idea of uh, you know, these nice, neat rows of huts, then this image might really surprise you. Uh, now, uh, we don't know the precise locations of Muhlenberg's or Whedon's brigades. So this one, um, the archeologists refer to it as the Virginia Brigade site, as it's either one or the other. Uh, and I, I'll use that same term. So with this Brig Virginia Brigade site, they'll be pretty surprising for many to see. You don't have these nice, neat rows. There aren't three rows of huts. It's just haphazard. In fact, the, the closest thing we get to any kind of structure is that maybe there are these uh, streets perhaps, uh, in uh, this opening here and uh, with, uh, you know, these huts facing in that direction. Uh, but the way I like to think of it is, well, you can almost see who was the last person to, <laughs> to build a hut, you know, like if someone had like a pile of soil or a pile of sticks or logs in one location, then, you know, this guy had to build around it and it couldn't easily have, uh, you know, the chimney facing to the rear. You know, because there's a pile of logs in the way. Who knows? But uh, I think just the haphazard uh, formation of these huts is probably reflective of all the material they're bringing in and dumping in place, and people are trying to build around them. Uh, the other thing I'd like to, to point out are these pits, uh, pits one, two, three, and four. Uh, these, uh, actually, uh, yeah, that pit is looks to be inside uh, one of the huts. But, you know, there are these accounts of the soldiers relieving themselves in uh, the company streets. Uh, and uh, there are orders going out again and again, forbidding the men from doing so and having harsh punishments if they're caught doing so. Uh, but then you see an order coming out uh, where they're allowing people to dig 
pits in the encampments close to the huts and for men to do their business and they cover it over with soil uh, you know twice a day and the reason why they start doing this is you know the men who are relieving themselves in the company streets they probably uh, were too weak to to make it to to the vault you know the big trench cut just outside uh, the camp to the rear of the encampment uh, because they're they're sick with dysentery they're sick with a uh, typhoid fever or one of these diseases they're just too sick to make it there right so uh, this is why they start adapting to having these uh, pits dug more locally and later when they're inoculating the troops of smallpox right and then the men will be quarantined within their own huts uh, and they may be brought under guard, uh, march to the vault, uh, or else just uh, um, you know watch over uh, with a guard uh, while they they use uh, you know the, the local pits. So that is reflected here as well. In terms of some of the dimensions, the largest hut you see here uh, is 12 and a half feet by 12 feet. That's probably number 13. Uh, the reconstructed huts that we have at Muhlenberg's Brigade uh, today are on the right. So that gives you an idea of the size. I mean, some of these are a third or even a quarter the size of our reconstructed huts. Uh, three of these have corner fireplaces. Uh, the smallest hut is seven and a half feet by six and a half feet. And number 16 doesn't even have a fireplace. Uh, my favorite one is number eight, this uh, boot shaped one. It just shows the irregularity in the shape of these huts. Uh, so this uh, is, uh, part of a ground penetrating radar survey where they uncovered this hut uh, and uh, a photo after they excavated it. So this is at the M10 uh, location, approximately, uh, you know, where Muhlenberg's brigade is today, perhaps, uh, or, or it may be Whedon's brigade, uh, a little bit closer to that. Uh, but yeah, you, you can see that uh, this is a hut with a very irregular shape. Uh, no stone foundations. They're going off of the discoloration in the soil from the logs that uh, have uh, rotted away. And uh, yeah, that's what you see uh, remaining. So, you know, when we look at the huts, you have to imagine a wider variety. Like, is this hut going to have a gabled roof? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not exactly easy to do. Uh, so I imagine uh, like a lean-to style roof would probably make that turn a little bit easier. Any other questions? Yep. Um, what types of materials were used to pack between the logs? Yeah, so uh, there is the chinking uh, is, is the word for the material packed between the logs. Uh, clay is preferred when they can't find that. Uh, they can use mud. You can mix that with straw. It's also clear that any small stones that they encounter when digging, those are being pushed into the joints as well. Uh, from the archaeological evidence, you do see some of those stones that turn up closer to uh, the, the where the walls are positioned. So you do see some, some accounts describing what they think are, are the stones that uh, were packed into the chinking, but they're not using lime, right? Uh, they're, they're not mixing uh, anything like that, any kind of mortar, just mud, clay is preferable. Yeah. And why would hut alignment be different than shown in the paintings of the time? Yeah. Well, the paintings uh, are romanticized and they're also based upon the written accounts. And the written accounts versus the archaeological evidence, you, you see this divergence. So um, you know, sometimes we have our best guess and our best guess originally is that they would follow the regimented castramentation and organization of a military camp. Uh, but maybe there are areas uh, where they were kind of digging around a stump Maybe they uh, or dumped a bunch of logs and supplies, uh, and you know, uh, one platoon isn't uh, willing to move them, and the other platoon are like, "Hey, move your your stuff. My hut needs to go there." And they're like, "No, you know, go go do your own thing." And they'll have to build their hut, uh, you know, uh, alongside it. So some of these huts may have just been built around stumps, built around dumped material, building material from other platoons, and uh, you know, I mean. They probably cooperated a great deal, but you know, human nature being what it is, uh, human differences might have prevented them from uh, keeping, uh, you know, uh, building these uh, in the locations they may have wanted to do. So, I mean, I really love looking at these uh, Virginia Brigade uh, 
archaeological uh, dig uh, schematics because it, it just is revealing uh, of potentially how haphazard it can be. We don't always see that though. Again, Maxwell's Brigade, very regimented. Uh, here in Wayne's Woods, again, we see a greater regimentation and uh, an organization of the huts. Uh, so this is uh, um, close to, uh, this pictured here from these 1966 excavations are close to Wayne's Monument. Uh, there were some future excavations uh, that were done in these different locations. Uh, but again, you have the private soldiers, uh, their huts are closer to the front. Uh, and to the rear of the encampment, you have the officers' huts. Uh, here's another officer's area that was excavated. Uh, I'd like to point out that uh, you do have this officer's hut with two fireplaces, two hearths, two chimneys, right? So it's going to be extra warm, right? You have uh, six officers, uh, so two captains, two lieutenant, first lieutenants, two second le uh, lieutenants, right? So those officers belonging to different companies, maybe each one had their own fireplace. So some of them are built larger, but they have twice as many uh, hearths. So there, there are different uh, variations to consider that uh, are between officers' huts and privates' huts. Now, today, the reconstructed officers' hut at Muhlenberg Brigade, unfortunately, is put in line with the soldiers instead of to the rear of that line, uh, as they would have at the time. Uh, now, um, yeah, any other questions before we move on from some of the, the huts? Uh, nothing at this time. Okay. Now, um, the dining hut is something uh, a lot of people may be familiar with if you've taken tours of Washington's headquarters. Uh, and this was one dig in which they tried to locate that. Uh, and this is disrupted ground. Uh, they, there is about two feet of topsoil that was removed just to try and level this area. And if you think about that, there's a lot of archeological evidence that may have been cut away from the original foundation. Uh, but there is this sill trench that it is the best guess of where the edge of the dining hut may have been built. Uh, so the dining hut, this was built to create extra dining space for uh, you know, Washington and his aides who are living in um, the headquarters building um, by Isaac, uh, owned by Isaac Potts. Uh, at nighttime, uh, this could also become extra sleeping space, probably has another chimney. Uh, and, and fireplace to keep it uh, heated. And you're not going to let heated space go to waste. So the, the use of the space would probably change throughout the day. But uh, this is the best guess of the approximate dimensions and locations of that dining hut. Uh, and there was a well that likely dates to the encampment period as well. So I thought people would be interested in, in seeing these, uh, these items. Now, one thing you also see at Muhlenberg's Brigade is the reconstructed bake oven. Uh, unfortunately, early in the 20th century, uh, the, the residents uh, of the area and uh, when this was a state park, uh, people found what they believed to be bake ovens. And they reconstructed uh, or, or uh, restored these, uh, uh, these bake ovens. Uh, and they look something like this, you know, covered with earth and so on. Uh, but what they actually did, they confused them with camp kitchens, right? So those, those sites in Wayne's Woods that uh, were reconstructed and repurposed to be bake ovens, historically they were camp kitchens, which is a very different structure. Uh, so this is a, a reconstructed version. You could see a painting on uh, the right-hand side. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see that the soldiers are the ones doing the cooking, right? You know, each uh, mess group is responsible for cooking their own food. And that's, that's the men. The men uh, cook for themselves for the most part. Now, women may be helping out in a supporting role, but it is the responsibility of the men to do their own cooking. Uh, so, you know, for Women's Equality Day, something <laughs> to keep in mind, perhaps. But... Uh, yeah, so this example of a camp kitchen, you know, you dig a trench and you poke holes in the side of this wall and then a, a, a hole vertically. And when you build a hole uh, or build a fire inside that hole, all that heat is directed upward. You've basically created a stove with a very uh, directed fire 
And this is very, very good in terms of conservation and insulation of heat. It's the most fuel efficient way of cooking at all. Most fuel efficient ways. So this is why the men were forbidden from, um, from cooking in the huts and they were supposed to cook in the camp kitchens. So you would see an entire row of camp kitchens to the rear of the camp. Uh, and there are a few of them that have been uncovered at uh, Washington's Memorial Chapel or in Wayne's Woods. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, again, these have been mistaken for camp, uh, the camp kitchens have been mistaken for the bake ovens. And that confusion exists even to today. Uh, you know, there are images of camp kitchens and people mistake them for bake ovens and so on, uh, but very different animals. Now, here are a few examples. The one on the right is an actual uh, camp kitchen foundation from uh, Washington's Memorial Chapel area, uh, proximate location of Connecticut troops. And you can see that discoloration in the soil from, um, and, and uh, you know, that is uh, how they see the, the difference between disturbed ground and, uh, and that which isn't. I like this example from the left, uh, Hampshire militia at Barton's farm, this is in England. And you could see very well-defined trenches with these separate holes cut for those cook fires, right? And there'd be maybe 12 to 16 different uh, mess groups or platoons that are cooking all the way around. A very efficient way of, of distributing uh, men in cooking uh, space. Now, uh, what I also like about this picture is you could see beyond it, right, right? Two, three, four, you could see an entire row of those camp kitchens. Um, now, camp kitchens, uh, again, uh, the bake ovens, you know, we also know that there were bake ovens. The Continental Army needs to convert that flour to bread, right? Rather than just mix it into a paste with water and cook it onto a rock, you know, fire cake, it's not good for digestion. You're not getting all the nutrients you could if you had baked that into bread, right? So, here we see on the left, uh, bottom left, this is the remains of a bake oven at Fort Stanwix. On the right, uh, this is the remain of a couple uh, civilian bake ovens uh, in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, that uh, were most likely co-opted by the Continental Army in 1776 and 1777. Uh, now, these are more permanent bake ovens than you might have uh, at Valley Forge. There were about 30 cast iron portable bake ovens that were distributed to the Continental Army. Uh, 20 large, 10 small. Uh, the last remaining 12 uh, were issued out, I believe in January of 1778, and they're issued out to the brigades at the brigade level. So while the, the Army baker, you know, Christopher Ludwig, you know, he and a number of professional bakers, these are men hired for the purpose of baking bread or hardtack for the Continental Army, uh, they are likely across the, the Schuylkill River with the commissaries department. They may have built bake ovens there, but you have at each brigade, these brigade bake ovens as well. Uh, and we don't know exactly what they look like, but this is the only survi surviving archeological example of a brigade bake oven, a temporary one that we know of. Uh, now this uh, again was um, a, an early study, I believe this is uh, in the, the 1970s, in which they uncovered this. Uh, they did not fully excavate this, this stone structure, as they called it, right? It's a stone structure. It's roughly 12 and a half feet by seven feet. Uh, they found some shards of a, a gray stoneware uh, that they think is associated with it. And uh, to the west um, of uh, this structure, which is uh, right here, close to where this arrow is, there is burnt clay. Um, and so they have an idea that this is likely a uh, bake oven structure, a stone structure. Unfortunately, they haven't excavated it fully, so we don't know the exact shape of this. I mean, a lot of these bake ovens are sh shaped similar to pizza ovens today, uh, but uh, if they had these cast iron, sort of six-sided uh, portable ovens, you know, with a door in the front uh, and, you know, and a stove pipe in the back, you know, they may have built uh, this stone structure around the cast iron portable uh, bake ovens. And one thing lending to that idea is the fact that the, uh, the burnt red clay up close, when they did uh, 
uh, magnometry uh, 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 studies, uh, data, uh, detecting uh, you know, whether there's a magnetic field. Uh, it's, it appears as though it doesn't, the clay is no different than the surrounding soil. So they believe that it, it wasn't uh, very strong fires on the clay itself, uh, which, lent, you know, if the heat was greater, it would be in an oven itself. So this clay, this might be where they're sweeping some of, uh, you know, the ash and charcoal from the inside of some of those ovens into this area. This, this is my interpretation. Uh, again, it's, it's very difficult to decide what this may have looked like. Uh, this is one reconstruction that, that I, I created. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea that you maybe have some kind of log uh, structure that uh, is building up uh, the base. Uh, and, uh, and because it's all rotted away and they didn't excavate it, we don't know if there was some base structure similar to this. The red clay in front, you know, your portable cast iron bake ovens, and then you're building, you know, a rock structure around it. So if this is a reconstruction, best guess of what it may have looked like. But, uh, you know, if we go back to the mesh shelter or the, uh, the camp kitchens, uh, Bennett Cuthbertson, uh, he wrote a book called uh, Economy of a Battalion. It's uh, in 1768. It's a military manual. And he describes a covered mesh shelter where they basically take long poles and build a conical structure above this, uh, almost shaped like a teepee. And you weave green sticks between it like a, like a waddle and daub almost, right, uh, to create a structure that would surround this entire thing. So you can build a roof, you know, a structure over a camp kitchen. Uh, we don't have any te textual examples of, of this during the American Revolution, but we know it's something that they could have done at the time. So if they can cover, you know, a mess, uh, a camp kitchen, they could potentially cover a bake oven, right? What if there was a bake oven hut at the brigade level? We, we really don't know. This is kind of one of those enduring mysteries. You know, I, I mean, uh, it could have been built uh, within a hut. And we have this rectangular shape. What if this, basically, when it uh, was broken apart and, uh, you know, any of this, the wooden uh, piece elements to it was rotted away, what if it collapsed into the cellar of a hut? You know, with the Virginia Brigades, if they dug down, you know, the floor of a hut, uh, maybe, you know, this, this bake oven collapsed into the, the cellar of a hut, and that is contributing to the, the rectangular shape that has been preserved as well. Uh, okay. Open yep. question. You know, the reconstruction of bake ovens, this is something that is widely debated today. Uh, this is uh, my best guess of what uh, it may have looked like, uh, with the intriguing possibility that this bake oven could be uh, inside a, a purpose-built hut. Now these get really hot during the summertime in May of 1778. Uh, they actually gave orders to cut windows into the huts uh, to keep these from uh, becoming too humid uh, and to remove the chinking between the logs, right, to allow the air to go into this area. <clears throat> we have so, some questions, yeah. Justin? Please. Um, is there a reconstructed camp kitchen in Valley Forge Park? There is not. Uh, and part of the difficulty is you need to arch archaeologically clear an area before you can create a reconstruction because if you're going to build it, you have to disturb the soil. So if you were ever to reproduce one, which I would love to see, uh, it would have to be done in coordination with uh, the park archaeologists and that work needs to be done first. Any other question? Are the excavations preserved <clears throat> that you're showing? Yes, um, they are underneath uh, the ground. Um, so this one in particular, uh, this was never fully excavated. So they uncovered it, and then they put the topsoil right back over the top. So this is untouched. It's still below the ground. So if future archaeologists wanted to further uh, explore this and determine uh, what was there, they can. Um, you know, we can learn a little bit more about the bake oven with more archaeological work, but uh, so far that has not been done. <clears throat> um, what made the bread so nutritious, I guess, as compared to the hardtack? Um, well, I mean, hardtack uh, hard uh, is, is, is going to be nutritious as well. Uh, but, um, 
particularly uh, when you create flour cakes or ash cakes, where you're just cooking uh, flour paste on ashes uh, or on a heated rock. Uh, it's it's not uh, you're not really breaking down you know the the elements uh, very well. Um, yeah, it's it's just uh, it's just not easy to digest. And if you can't digest it easily, then it's passing through your digestive system before you can fully, um, you know, absorb those those nutrients. So that's essentially what it comes down to. And uh, we also have a couple of comments. There was a bakehouse in Torresdale in Philadelphia that supplied some of Washington's troops. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. uh, a compliment to you, great engaging use of photo editing to let us visualize some of the possible variations of the Hudson ovens. Really neat. Well, oh, thank you. Yeah, I thought we'd have some fun with this. Yep. Um, I do want to, to point out that uh, with the speaker series that's upcoming, uh, October 8th being the first one, uh, because today's Women's Equality Day, it's appropriate that our first talk is uh, on the women's suffrage movement. Uh, but if you are really interested in all this material, I really encourage you to look at this future, whoops, this future talk. Uh, by Stephen Elliott. Uh, he'll be a speaker in May of next year. <clears throat> and he wrote his dissertation on winter quarters of the Continental Army. And Valley Forge, he argues, was a key turning point, right? This was a moment in which they decide to build a log city. And they use that model in future winter encampments. So, you know, he describes this as a really revolutionary moment. Uh, and Continental Army strategy. So that's what his dissertation is based on. His book is coming out next year, and he will be one of our future speakers. Uh, do we have any uh, last questions? There's uh, one more question. How many excavations were done, and are there still some to be discovered? Well, certainly. I mean, um, you know, the excavations, there, there is, uh, uh, some some talk and grant money about uh, doing excavations uh, near Artillery Park. I know that is something that our park archaeologist John Turk is interested in doing. But uh, that is, you know, that's um, that that is um, one possibility. I don't really know much more about that. Just have heard uh, that. But um, but overall, there are I don't know a couple dozen different uh, archaeological digs over the years. Uh, you know, I mean, the 1960s and earlier, and the problem is there were not that uh, good record, there were not good, there was not good record keeping in the early 20th century. So a lot of these digs left behind very little evidence. Uh, in some cases, the surviving artifacts, uh, you know, from like the 1940s or 1950s explorations, those are gone. In some days, we might have only a one or two page summary of an entire dig. Uh, you know, you see these referenced uh, in other um, other publications. So uh, we really don't know how many archaeological digs have been done. But um, uh, yeah, there were, were some pretty impressive ones that were done uh, most recently. And um, with the citations, I definitely recommend this uh, this book. Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, Historical Archaeology of the Revolutionary War Encampments of Washington's Army. Uh, chapters are also available on JSTOR if you want to look at that. Uh, but uh, these are summarizing some of the most recent archaeological explorations, including Wayne's Woods uh, and those digs that were carried out uh, at uh, the Washington Memorial Chapel grounds and uh, also uh, a firing range that was located uh, pretty close to the um, administration building. Uh, so very interesting chapters in that book, which are worth looking at. Any other last questions? I think we're at about time. Yep. Um, excellent talk with great graphics and many thanks. Quite for, welcome. For coming through. So, so thank you again for the opportunity. This has been fun. Yep. On, on behalf of the Valley Forge Alliance and the two different libraries and the local historical societies, we thank you very much and look forward to uh, the future presentations. Thank you. Thank Dustin. you. I just want to add uh, that uh, digging for archaeological artifacts or, or looting, uh, that is illegal and a felony offense. Uh, archaeology is really key here at Valley Forge because uh, the artifacts, when you uncover them, you know, the position of the data, 
uh, all that evidence is lost uh, with uh, any uh, illegal looting. So uh, uh, again, please do not do that. Uh, respect uh, Belly Forge's resources and uh, do not disturb our archeological positions. Thank you.